Every time I have these conversations, I realize that I'm sat in a chair for a living <laughs> for sometimes three hours at a time. Today, I've been sat in this chair for about seven hours. And I go, fuck, this is not going to be good for me over the long term. If I do this podcast for the next 10 years, maybe I should just wrap it in here. I mean, it's been a good run. Does it, does it matter that I'm spending so much time sitting down? Is there any evidence that this is going to, you know, have an adverse effect? Well, so the evidence is that um, if you, so people who sit more, um, it, it can be an issue. Uh, there's, but there's two issues. One is that if you look at the epidemiological data, what really matters is um, leisure time sitting versus work time sitting. So people who have, who sit a lot at work, but then also sit a lot in their leisure time when they're not at work, they're the ones who want, run way more risk of disease than people who are just sitting a lot at work. So that's one issue, right? So, so I think you're probably okay because I'm, I'm, I can tell you, you know, I, I know that you're obviously very physically active. You work out, etc. That's that's going to help be very protective. But the other issue, and I think we talked about in, my, in the previous interview, is sitting bout. So, so how long you sit for a particular period is also very important. So we should be getting up every twenty minutes. You're going to be uh, interviewing Dave Reichlin in a few days. So Dave Reichlin published one of my favorite papers ever, who showed that the Hadza sit just as much as Westerners. They sit about 10 hours a day. Um, but they get up all the time. Every If you're in a Hadza camp, you know, there's babies running around. They get up to get the babies. They're getting around to tend the fire. They're getting up all the time. They're, nobody sits for a few hours and just like does what you and I are doing. And when you get up, you're kind of turning on the metabolism of your body. You're turning on your muscles. It's like turning on the car engine, right? You're, you're, you're kind of w awakening all kinds of metabolic processes. And that seems to have a huge amount of benefit. So the key is if you're going to sit, get up a lot. Right. Go get up, go, go pee, make a cup of tea, whatever, you know, get, interrupt your sitting a I'll lot. I'll be right back. And, <laughs> and of course, if you're going to sit at work, make sure that you're not spending, you know, sitting in your car to get to work isn't good. And then you go home and you sit on the couch and watch television. That's not good. Um, so, you know, make sure that those non-work periods of time are, um, don't involve too much sitting. Is that why we've got so many of these random pains, joint pains? You know, we were talking about, you said back pain is the would you say? It's the number one medical complaint in the world. Yeah. Back pain. And that surely is because of the way we've designed our chairs and our lives. <laughs> well, a part of that is also just back strength. So we, you know, I'm sitting in this lovely, comfortable chair here and I'm resting my back against it. I don't have to use any of the back muscles, right? So we, we, develop, we develop weak backs that don't have any endurance. So they're quickly fatigable, right? So, and actually the best predictor of whether somebody gets back pain is how strong their backs are. And not just like, uh, like you know, acute strength, like from doing, you know, like one thing. It's, it's how, 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 how much endurance their back muscles have. Because, because just think about it. Like, I don't know about you, but like every once in a while I get a back pain, right? I bend over to pick up a pencil or something like that. And I think, ah, it was picking up the pencil, right? But that's just the straw that literally broke the camel's back, right? <laughs> it's, it's really the fact that I just, it just happened to be the the event that triggered it, but it's when my back is weak, right? That I'm just more likely to do something a little bit weird and then trigger something that causes a spasm, right? But having um, strong back muscles is the way to really to prevent back pain. If someone's just heard everything you've said about these mismatched diseases, there's a lot to take in. You know, there's a lot of different mismatched diseases. You said that if you're going to die from anything, it's basically going to be one of these mismatched diseases. Is there a conclu conclusion? Is there an actionable conclusion about something maybe that I can change or do today? Or is there, there a philosophy you can lend me that is going to reduce my chances of getting one of these mismatched diseases, just like a broader philosophy towards a life? Yes. I, well, two, I think there's two. The first is that understanding why we get particular kinds of mismatches helps us make decisions about how to use our bodies, right? What to eat, how to be physically active, how to sit. I mean, all the things that we've been talking about result in action items, right? Let's get up more often, right? Let's uh, not eat sugary, fatty foods so often, right? Let's, you know, let's uh, try to avoid psychosocial stress, which is, you can't just, you know, wave a magic wand and do that. That's a hard one. But we think that our life is normal. We think it's normal to live the kinds of, you know, everybody thinks their life is normal, right? We think the foods that we eat are normal, the kinds of physical activities that we do are normal, the, the clothes that we wear, the shoes that we wear are normal. Cars. Cars, Texas. all of that, yeah. right? And, but um, from an evolutionary perspective, they're not normal. That doesn't mean they're not good or, or that they're necessarily bad, right? 
but but it's it gives us a chance to pause and think and ask you know do we have to live with this right or or how can we modify the way we use cars and taxis and shoes and you know we can don't have to get rid of shoes but maybe we'd be better off with more minimal shoes especially for our kids maybe we'd be better off without you know processed foods that are have all the fiber you know removed and all that you know that fat and sugar added and all kinds of other crap right again let's not engage in a paleo fantasy and pretend that hunter gatherers don't get sick or that you know hunter gatherer you know what if eating like a hunter gatherer will make you, you know, absolutely healthy, that's not the way it works. But we have information that we can learn from our evolutionary history that helps us make better decisions. So that's point one. And point two is that we need to be really aware of this vicious cycle that we've created in our modern world, whereby treating the symptoms of these mismatched diseases are actually driving forward the system and making things worse. There's a reason that heart disease is going up in the world. There's a reason that diabetes is going up in the world. There's a reason that myopia is going up in the world, right? It's because we're, we're, we're creating novel environments for which our bodies are poorly or inadequately adapted. And then instead of preventing those causes, we're simply, when we can, treating the symptoms. And, and so we're not stopping that you know, the, 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 the fundamental problem from occurring. And, and thinking about it that way from a kind of modern sort of cultural evolutionary perspective, it's not a form of natural selection. It's a kind of cultural evolution that's going on, but it's cultural evolution that's affecting our bodies. And thinking about that vicious cycle that we've created can help us stop the vicious cycle. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.